All right, are these mics on? They definitely are. Good morning or afternoon, depending on when you start, stopped your night last night. Um, I am going to ask the people in the back to not be afraid of coming closer to the front. Uh, I don't know how many people will move, but basically, if you are a brave individual thinker who doesn't listen to commands, come up front. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't work. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful to see you here. Um, you are at Death to Roadways, ending traffic with flying cars. Uh, if this is where you intended to be, get ready for a fantastic hour. If you didn't intend to be here, stick around anyway. It's more interesting than anything else going on. Um, and what we're going to talk about in this session is basically, you know, we have seen, even just in a few short years, a transportation revolution. Um, if you had asked me 10 years ago, would I open something called an app to order a car by a stranger for my mom who lives 3,000 miles away, I'd tell you you were crazy. Um, and actually, that's what I do now all the time for her. So I feel like my own appetite for the possibility of the way we move around has really changed uh, thanks to just a few consumer brands that we all know. Um, and you know, any walk around Austin tells you that plenty of us are dying to get off the roads and into the air, um, just so you're not hit by a bicycle or electric scooter. Um, so we're gonna talk a bit uh, about the technology, the public policy, um, the economics of flying taxis and autonomous vehicles in the air. Um, and as we're having this discussion, I just wanna point out there's a microphone there as well as there, there, I believe. So if you have questions, basically in the last 15 minutes or so, we'll be taking questions, so please get those ready. Uh, if you're listening to the live stream and you have questions, you can tweet them to hashtag Bell South by Southwest or hashtag Bell SXSW as shown up over there. So you can tweet your questions and we'll be, we'll be looking out for those as well. So, by way of introductions, my name is Arthi Shahani. I'm Silicon Valley correspondent for National Public Radio. Uh, I'm also a soon-to-be first-time author. My book is coming out October 1st. It's called Here We Are, American Dreams, American Nightmares. Uh, it does not relate to technology, but certainly relates to our country. Um, and I am extremely excited to be here. I just spent the last six months in profound solitude writing a manuscript. And this is basically my first week out of solitude. Um, and, you know, it's extremes. And if my fellow panelists can just introduce themselves as well, a little bit about you know, who you are, what you do. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Shavika Sadev. I'm an associate partner with McKinsey and & Company. And I spend all my time working with clients in aerospace and automotive and other industries, helping them think about how to respond to disruptions in mobility, whether it's from electrification or autonomy or shared mobility. Um, and they're thinking about whether these are threats to their current businesses or provide, uh, provide opportunities for new growth. Uh, and then urban mobility is coming up more and more in that discussion as it relates to disrupting ground transportation as well as air. And we are helping them answer questions about, I'm sure similar questions that you might have. When will this be real? How big is this gonna be? Um, what are the economics gonna look like? All to help them think about what, how this fits into their broader strategy. Good morning, I'm Jaewon Shin. I'm, I'm Associate Administrator for Aeronautics at NASA headquarters. Um, and I, I really want to thank uh, Bell and, and South by Southwest for organizing this conference, uh, uh, pretty exciting. Um, we work on all types of uh, aeronautics and aviation technologies. So uh, some of you may know that uh, NASA actually does aeronautics research, not only space uh, exploration. So uh, my uh, former administrator used to say that NASA, the first A of NASA is the big A. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, we, we have actually uh, 102 years of uh, history uh, doing uh, aeronautics research for the country. And pretty much all the technologies that you see in the modern aircraft, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's uh, commercial airliners, uh, helicopters, or uh, even military aircraft, uh, you could see the trace of NASA uh, technologies in collaboration with industry. So 
Uh, we are very excited moving into uh, this urban air mobility and the uh, new applications uh, in aviation. And so uh, I look forward to conversation. Thank you. And, and I'm Michael Thacker. I lead technology and innovation for Bell. Um, Bell has been changing the way the world flies for over 80 years, primarily in vertical lift, but we're also uh, the first brake sound barrier, um, the first jet fighter, uh, a number of other firsts, including working on the lunar lander. Um, so, you know, changing the way we fly and taking technology and trying to bring the benefits of aviation to more people is what Bell has been about for our entire history, and we see a tremendous opportunity now with the convergence of technologies in electric, hybrid electric, and distributed propulsion, with the computational capability and control algorithms that are available today to be able to, to operate those aircraft to really, again, bring the benefits of aviation to more people. We recently introduced the Bell Nexus, uh, which is an air taxi concept for urban air mobility, uh, and the Bell Apt family, which is for logistics carrying cargo uh, and packages from distribution center to distribution center to distribution center to store. Uh, we think the time is now, and we're very excited about this change in the way we, we move about our cities. It's a very seductive commercial you guys have also for the Nexus. <laughs> I watched it, and I was like, oh, you're manipulating me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, part of why so many of us are actually having this conversation is because a company we use regularly now for transit, Uber, announced, hey, we're going to do this. And Uber set the goal of by 2023, they're going to have flying taxis in a handful of cities. By way of show of hands, how many of you believe it? 2023, Uber app, flying taxi, show of hands, 2023. <laughs> So we're in a room where nearly half of the people believe that. That's amazing. Um, I might actually be part of that show of hands. Um, how many of you believe that within a decade, if not, by 20, if not by 2023, within a decade we're going to see that option? Everyone, pretty much. So this, I think, is the reason there is um, so much interest and need to actually understand the behind the scenes of what's going on. What are the barriers? I know that you know we might think that the barriers are something that they're not, but each of the three of you is heavily involved in the fields getting your hands dirty. So I'd like each of you to just start by telling me what is your projection uh, by way of your throw it out and feel free to disagree with your partner Uber. That's actually better. <laughs> uh, what is your projection? And what do you think the greatest barrier will be? And it could be a range of things. It could be technology related, it could be not technology related, please. In any order you prefer. Michael. Okay. So I'll, I'll go first. Um, so, so for commercial operations, uh, carrying people, we think mid 2020s, 2025 kind of time frame is realistic. Don't, don't think that that splash in a city, we have thousands of aircraft flying about a city on day one uh, in that kind of operation. It will be a crawl, walk, run scenario where you start with tens of aircraft in a city and it progressively moves out from there um, to hundreds and, and eventually to thousands. Um, so when you think about that decadal, what happens in the decade or more, uh, is it more universally available? I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, but the initial will be a little bit smaller than that. It will likely be piloted um, for initial operations as we develop um, the, the trust, the regulatory framework, and everything to be able to move to a more autonomous system that will reduce cost so that it can be available to more people. Um, but, but we do think, you know, the, the folks who raise their hands for by the end of the decade, it'll be available to most of the people in this room. I, I think that's fair. And, and just a, a clear answer to the second part of my question, what's the barrier? Like, it, there are many barriers, okay, don't get me wrong, but choose one of your favorites. <laughs> So, so you're right, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of challenges along the way, but I would say one of the, the largest ones that we're actually working with NASA on with the, a system integration operationalization project is the, the low altitude airspace and how you manage the vehicles within this low altitude airspace, interacting both with the communities and with the existing uh, national airspace where aircraft fly today. Yeah, I would agree with uh, Michael's timeline and, and also the barrier. Um, we didn't coordinate this answer, by the way. But so you agree, 2025-ish? Yeah, I, I think a little bit of a, a addition there is, yeah, 2025, I think we, we probably would see some limited um, uh, operation, commercial operation. 
But I think uh, for this market to really flourish and really pan out as all of you raise your hand and I want to uh, use this uh, service, um, we, I think we really need to mature the uh, market at scale and that may take uh, a decade. But um, in, order, in order to get there, I think the, as Michael said, the first barrier is really the air traffic management system because the current uh, very centralized and very ground-based and some augmented by uh, space, but pretty much a ground-based uh, tracking system and voice uh, uh, heavy uh, air traffic management will not be able to handle mm. this massive uh, scale. So uh, that's why uh, we at NASA has, has been uh, working on this completely new paradigm uh, called the UAS traffic management. It's funny that it started from dealing with uh, UAS, small UAS, uh, of, or drones. And then uh, all of a sudden people started getting interested in, hey, why, why don't we put people <laughs> in the uh, drones, or larger drones? So I think the, the concept uh, could be applicable for both uh, market, uh, drone market and uh, UAM market. And so when you say voice operated being a problem for air traffic control, so are you envisioning or working on technology that you basically have like a Siri or Alexa telling? So it, it'll be a uh, heavily uh, data shared environment. So all the service providers will share the data and where the vehicles are and uh, where the vehicles would like to go. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, it'll, be, it'll be really uh, uh, the huge benefactor of a digital transformation. So I think we'll be talking about a lot of this, but if, if the digital revolution or transformation hasn't happened, um, I don't believe this market would have been even conceived. Yeah, I, think I, I agree. The, the UTM system describes for the traffic management, absolutely a barrier. The, the other one, of course, is some of the technology with the batteries being able to support this kind of flight. But I think another one we think about from the infrastructure side is, is the physical space. So when you want this type of flight at scale, as people in this room are making a decision of point A to point B, how far is that vertiport or skyport, whatever you want to think of, do I have to travel or drive 10 minutes, five minutes, three minutes to get to that takeoff or landing spot um, will be again an important part of bringing the market to scale. Um, so it's truly a benefit, it's truly a better option than the incumbent mode as, you, as, as everyday travelers make that decision. And that's a really big question is who will build that infrastructure? What will it look like? Is it some of these big new mega ports that you know, some of the names you mentioned have described? Or is it going to be using existing rooftops of um, buildings we already have? Mm. And the first part of my question, what oh, year do you put it at? Yeah. I would agree <laughs> with specific use cases um, in an niche mode in the 2025. And I do think the way we tell our clients often is not to put a definitive by 2030, 2032, you have so many, but track the indicators. So when we have the regulatory framework, the traffic management framework, and the infrastructure, then we would see it scale. I see, so you tell your clients to never answer that question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so something that's, that's to me actually very interesting about each of your answers is that from a layman's perspective, and I could certainly come to this as a layman, from a layman's perspective, I would have thought that the greatest barrier has something to do with how you build the vehicle. And each of you gave an answer that was not about that. But let's talk for a moment about that vehicle. I mean, there's a lot of competition right now, a lot of companies working on this. You know, you, sort of, you see mocks all over the place, some very pretty and some, you know, not easy on the eyes, but with great promise. Talk a bit about what are some of the tech, you know, the technological breakthroughs that make you optimistic that you'll be able to move us from, you know, helicopters don't work for this. And so to build it, what are the breakthroughs that you're relying on that you're optimistic about? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll first challenge the first part that helicopters don't work for this. Helicopters <laughs> okay, can work for this. The limitations for helicopters are noise and cost. Uh -huh. Because the mission and the ability to move people about the cities, we do that today. We just right. do it for a very limited set of people, and in many cities there are limitations on access because of noise. Uh -huh. So part of the key to the technologies required to make this more universally available is to address those two things. One, the noise has to blend in with the background noise of the city, 
And the second one is that the cost needs to come to a point where more of us can take advantage of the benefits that it brings to the transportation system. And so that's really what drives the technology challenge, what drives a move from a large single rotor to distributed multiple blades being able to lift the aircraft. Part of that is noise. Part of that's going to a simpler system where instead of very complex gears that drive a helicopter today, you have very simple electric motors directly driving the blades. But that drives the cost part of the equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think um, your question, Ari, is a really important one because uh, why didn't we think about this or work on this you know, many decades ago? I mean, there, there are a lot of cartoons. And, you've, and been, you've been talking about it for a while. Yeah, so. you yeah. Too. There are a lot of Jetsons type and cartoons yeah. and so on. So everybody wanted and um, dreamed about this. But um, I think it's, it's the 21st century revolution in technology. So convergence, convergence of many different technologies are maturing to the level that now aviation can benefit mm -hmm. to put these things together. So um, that's why from like tacky from like us, we, we think uh, this is a new era for aviation. It's just opening up for us. And um, Michael talked about electric uh, distributed propulsion system, but uh, batteries and communication and the, the sheer um, cap capability to process gobs of data, mm -hmm. huge amount of data, and all these things are coming together. So that's why you didn't hear in our initial answer that vehicle challenges. There are certainly a tremendous amount of vehicle challenges, but they are somewhat of a, a, a maturity they, they are at the maturity that we can conceive that vehicle can actually happen. Mm -hmm. And so we need to worry really about all the other things, infrastructure and, and system mm -hmm. issues. And I actually want to dig into each of those a little bit more. So one thing, at, at the hardware side, you're basically talking about moving from that spinning rotor to lightweight wings. And has, has there been like a advances that make that more possible for this, what you call distributed electric, electric propulsion? Uh, propulsion? Yeah, so again, the, the idea, and particularly for the Nexus, uh, rather than a single large um, set of blades like you would have on a helicopter, there are six ducted fans that provide the lift. All those fans rotate um, as you fly so that you transition from vertical flight to forward flight on wing, which gets you to an efficiency state where the ducts and the wing are providing some of the lift rather than all of that coming from the blades themselves. That efficiency helps you be able to use the electric propulsion system to accomplish a reasonable mission. So getting on wing is really important mm -hmm. for the energy efficiency of the aircraft to make it work. And what does it do for sound? So the, the same thing. The, the number one driver for a helicopter noise is the tip speed of the main rotor. So mm -hmm. if you shrink the size of those blades, you bring down the speed at the tip of each one of those blades, which reduces the noise by an order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. and I think that also reduces then the cost. If you change the propulsion mechanism and you have a battery operated, you, know, you put a battery in the, in the vehicle instead, um, the fuel, the maintenance cost goes down. And then when you layer autonomy in, when you take the pilot out of the vehicle, th that combination brings the cost to a level where it becomes comparable to a mode of transit that we would use. Can we talk about the battery for a moment? Because I, I think anyone who has an iPhone knows that consumers don't generally believe that we're very far along in battery power. Um, so, thank you. So, so, explain a little bit. Like, do you, are the batteries becoming more powerful to do this? Tell me about the batteries. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can just mention a little bit, and Michael is actually a vehicle developer, so uh, I, I, know, I think he's the domain expert here. Mm -hmm. But in, in layman's terms, uh, in aviation, um, th there are really s several unique aspects that we have to worry about. It's the weight. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you just cannot put all these heavy uh, duty and uh, uh, weight heavy batteries on the aircraft because uh, the weight will kill, kill you, right? So Michael talked about efficiency. So the power density, so how much power you can actually extract out of certain amount of weight. Uh, I think that technology has come along uh, far enough uh, from the battery industry. Uh, compared to uh, automotive uh, needs, 
I mean, they, they do care about weight, but uh, not as much as uh, aviation. So um, I think that progress is uh, accelerating uh, from the battery industry. So that, that's what it enables. Uh, it's not me We're making all this distracted argument. right now. We don't know what it is. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's what's enabling um, this op opportunity. So that's kind of just a short comment from me. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, tagging on to that, I think battery technology has advanced to the point where these configurations are possible for limited mission sets. And so for the autonomous pod transport family that we have for carrying packages, that, that configuration is all electric uh, and it's intended for relatively short ranges. The Nexus that we showed at Consumer Electronics Show and unveiled is actually a hybrid configuration. And the reason for that is to carry the kind of payloads that we want to carry, the number of people, the amount of, of cargo, and to carry it the distance that we want to go, the battery technology isn't quite there yet. So it's a fully electric system that really doesn't care where the energy comes from. But for the Nexus, it, has, it still has a gas burning engine along with the battery system. It's part of the redundancy of the aircraft but to, for safety, but it also is a recognition that today, for the, for, for the distance we want to go, the batteries aren't there. We do believe that they'll get there, the trajectory is moving uh, t t to be there. So in that kind of decadal view of when we're gonna be going out and having this more universally available, we think the Nexus will be all electric by that time. And so just to get a sense of, for now, batteries that are available that are carrying a payload of four adults, how long could it go for? So it's going to depend on the configuration, right? Uh, I mean, just and, 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 there, under range. and there are a lot of people. But if you mm -hmm. if you if you package the batteries in such a way that you satisfy aviation safety needs, which are different from other industries, mm -hmm. so that you're dealing with all of the different potential failure modes that you could have within the battery, when you package that, that this energy density, the amount of power you can get out of a given weight, goes down from what the basic cell level is by quite a bit. Um, so maybe it's 20 miles with reserves to be able to land, which can give you a mission, but it doesn't get you across all of the portions of a city that you would want to. Yeah, so I think, I think it is important, Ari, uh, for all of us to remember that in, if you look at the automotive industry, there isn't only one model, right? There are, there are a variety of uh, uh, vehicles serving different purposes. So I think uh, um, from my perspective, this market, if it pans out again, as we are hoping for, um, I think it will have uh, several different models at different capability levels uh, to serve different missions. So mm -hmm. if it's a very short, uh, just city hop kind of application, then the, with the advent uh, progress of battery, within decade, we can probably have all electric uh, battery powered uh, vehicle, very light, very short distance. Uh, frequent uh, uh, operations, but if, if you want to go from maybe neighboring city to like a... Like I'm thinking San Francisco to yeah, San Jose, exactly. right? Exactly. So, yeah, like, if you think about some distance, then uh, the vehicle probably will have a, uh, some sort of hybrid uh, system as Michael talked about, and it may have a, a wings to mm -hmm. uh, have a little bit more uh, lift. So I think it, you will probably see uh, a whole set of uh, a variety of concepts. And that's why if you Google uh, UAM or something, uh, you would see like hundreds of different concepts. And uh, it's, it's right. a wild, wild west that, out there. That's kind of, I think that part of the question is from, from the mock-ups, from the pilots we've seen so far, what, has, what do you hold as like, look, they just did that. Here's an example of how far it can go. Like what's, what's the best that we've seen so far? Do we know? So again, it, it's, there are a lot of decisions that go into what an aircraft design looks like. And some of those are, what do you believe the, the population that's going to use this looks like? Um, how comfortable are they with aviation? Do you want, I mean, for instance, as simple as do you use ducted fans or open, open blades? Mm -hmm. It is a, is a design philosophy question. And for carrying people, we've chosen to go with ducted fans. Mm -hmm. Um, th there are a number of reasons for that, but not everybody has. So there's an efficiency of aircraft that's a part of the design, but there are other design factors that go into it that aren't, that aren't all explicitly about how far will the aircraft go. Mm -hmm. Do you want to, okay. So we have learned, or, you know, in talking to each of you, what's been clear is that the ride-hailing platforms Uber and Lyft 
have in some ways um, really helped to bring this conversation to the fore. What have you learned from them, particularly I guess Uber is who you partner with, what have you learned from them that, you know, as leaders in companies that are not necessarily, you know, consumer facing, I don't have my NASA app or my, my Bell app, right? Or, I mean, you advise, you advise, right? <laughs> um, what have you learned in the process of partnering? I mean, I, maybe, I think partnership is at, and from our point of view, partnership is at the core of this. Without partnerships, uh, we don't believe this ecosystem is one that can be created, even based on just things you've heard, without a series of players with different capabilities mm -hmm. coming together. And that includes the, the vehicle OEMs that have to figure out the technology, some of the scientific discovery around battery density, which we've been talking about, um, the public policy makers to ensure that the safety standards are held where customers are comfortable getting in this vehicle, mm -hmm. um, the infrastructure providers who are actually gonna build that. So partnership, I think, is critical, and players like the aggregator platforms will play the role of making it accessible to customers in what's becoming more and more the type of mobility that we ask for, which is seamless point A to point B. And people are caring less and less about what's the mode of transit that I take. What you want is, I want to go from point A to point B, and I want an integrated solution. And so I think our point of view is very much that partnerships are core, and without those partnerships, there is no single player or industry that can make this happen. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'll really um, emphasize what uh, uh, was just said uh, about the partnership. I think it's, it's really what uh, Uber has done so well up to this point is um, uh, recognizing that uh, so-called ecosystem, as Uber is calling, that everybody who has a stake and um, capability to offer really need to work together uh -huh. and make the progress simultaneously. <laughs> if, if one segment is lagging behind, this is not gonna happen. Um, so, um, one, one other thing that I noticed uh, involving in, in this discussion so far is how the overall technology trend is driving uh, this desire. That is, um, the technologies are coming to the end users, and uh, we like to control all the technologies, right? I mean, you, you, you're looking at the smartphone, to think about uh, 20, 30 years ago, we, we didn't even have um, a laptop that is so powerful that we can carry. We used to have, I, I don't, I'm dating myself, but I, when I was in college, <laughs> um, I never seen even computer. It was sitting in the central library at, on the campus, some big uh, mainframe computer. So I never even saw the computer. So the technologies are coming to our fingertips and on demand, and I think it's happening in the aviation as well, because aviation so far has not been uh, on demand uh, for a variety of reasons, and Michael uh, uh, emphasized all those. But I, I think it's finally happening, so, so that, that's very exciting. Yeah, so there are a couple things that we can add on, and if you can go to the next chart, I think it helps sure. uh, helps talk about it a little bit. So one one of the things that having uh, you know partners like Uber and others um, is the data that you can bring to the table about the actual use cases and what difference it can make, and would people actually use it? So you know this is an example, a couple of examples, uh, you know one in California and one in Brazil that show you what people are dealing with today and at certain times of day with the, the amount of time it takes to take a relatively short trip uh, on the ground. Um, and even if you make that a, a, a multimodal trip where you were to walk or drive to a, a vertiport, take off, fly, and land, and, and now you're probably close enough to your destination to walk, the time savings that's available from two hours down to 15 minutes is tremendous. And, and what this does for us is help us understand you know, some of the questions that were being asked at the very beginning around, okay, what does it actually look like and when would somebody actually use it, right? If, if, if the trip is a 10-mile is a, a trip and yes, it's gonna take me a half an hour um, to get there, but the, the transition of walk, fly, drive to get there only saves me five minutes, I'm probably not gonna do it, right? Grounds transportation is right. still the right answer. But if it's a, a 25 or a 30-mile trip 
and that 25 or 30 miles is going to take me two hours because of the kind of traffic that's in it, and I can cut that down to 20 minutes, even by using multiple, multiple modes of transportation, whether it's a scooter or a bike or whatever, to, to get there, then I'm going to choose that option. Um, if, if it makes sense to me, if it's urgent enough to me to do that. Kind of like you do in, in your app today, you know, which, which, which set of circumstances do I want to get, whether it's UberX, Uber Pool, Uber Black, you know, Uber Air would be another option at, at some point in the future, and, and other applications as well. And you know, I would say cities are also great partners in this, and that the cities need to be on board. They're all looking at how do we make our cities more livable as more and more people move into them. Mm -hmm. And so they're examining their transportation systems. They're looking at Hyperloop, they're looking at more highways, they're looking at trains, they're also looking at air and how does this integrate into their city. And so the cities are also partners. And, you know, Jaiwan talked about an ecosystem, and it really is that. The, mm -hmm. the aircraft is just one piece, but there's an ecosystem that has federal regulations involved with it, has a lot of local policy involved with it as mm -hmm. well as the rest of the transportation system because the aircraft doesn't operate alone, it really does operate as a part of a larger system. Right. What to me is sort of really fun and interesting about this visual that is, you know, I've seen circulating around is, you know, I think ultimately as consumers, what we want as, tra as uh, you know, travelers, what we want is from point A to point B, what's the total time? What does it cost me? I'm willing to do transfers, you know, provided I don't carry a lot with me. And I, I know plenty of us actually still choose to go, for example, from New York to D.C. by train instead of air because of the check-in time. And so I think what's interesting about this is I, I imagine that uh, in a not too distant future, the app is going or apps are going to be suggesting to me, here is the combination of things that you can do to get to a point, and these are the total prices of it. And sort of like lays out the, the preliminary of that. And there's actually already platforms that are doing that. Mm -hmm. Mo the, you know, mobility as a service, multimodal <coughs> platforms that are solving for these, what's the fastest combination? at your price point that your willingness to pay mm -hmm. that get you from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Shivika, you talk to governments and you advise them. You've helped governments build the infrastructure for electric, electric vehicles. Are they frustrated that you're now talking about flight as well? I mean, <laughs> how, how is this message received among the, the local, the cities that you deal with? Yeah. I think exactly as, as Michael and, and John alluded to, cities are looking for the best solution. The two big things, um, or three things I would say are in the mind of cities is access. You want to make sure every citizen uh, resident has good access to transit, but they want to do it in a way that's affordable, um, safe, and um, also kind of as efficient as can be. And they're dealing with issues we face, congestion and pollution. And so they absolutely are very open to any new solutions that help them circumvent potentially incumbent solutions and others. I think we talked about um, air mobility fitting into that, whether it's for parcel delivery, which may be a use case that comes sooner. You know, the drones work to deliver before they get to move us easily. Um, the other thing to consider is for cities that are not in, develop in the developed world where there isn't a lot of already incumbent transit infrastructure, Mm. Is this an opportunity to leapfrog very expensive ground-based transit, whether that's a big subway system or lots of roads and, and, and bus lanes, and have an air system that frankly could be much cheaper to build, could be environmentally more sustainable, and allows access in a way that you can get to remoter areas mm -hmm. uh, without having to spend a lot of money. So I think cities are very on board with factoring this in. What's the U.S.-China comparison here when you talk to regulators? Like, I, in my experience reporting, part of what, at any level of government, whether you're talking about a city official or a federal official, state official, there is increasingly an eye toward what is China doing and how do we compare? And so how does the U.S. regulatory infrastructure, as you've interfaced with it, compare to the Chinese? Who's going to have it first? Yeah. I'll start as a government uh, person here. <laughs> I, I think uh, that question is very uh, central to a lot of us in many different areas, not just uh, urban air mobility area. Uh, whenever we are talking about new emerging technologies, um, and uh, from our perspective, U.S. perspective, uh, safety, especially when it comes to transportation, safety is paramount. I mean, there's no compromise whatsoever. Uh, with the safety, especially in the air travel. And um, I, I'm not suggesting that China, the Chinese government uh, is 
less regarding the safety, but um, I think it's a matter of uh, uh, tolerance level, that if they are accepting higher tolerance level for risk, um, and it's not just China, there are some other countries also showing that kind of a uh, tendency, then whenever you deal with this kind of uh, unproven and still uh, unchartered uh, new territory, uh, again, it's not limited to transportation, but any types of uh, uh, new capabilities, I think it is, it is something we have to pay attention. That, uh, that's why FAA, uh, I gotta give a lot of credit to FAA that uh, they have come a long way uh, in terms of uh, really aggressively moving out to uh, uh, change their regulation uh, process and also a certification process as well. So it's, it's still in works, uh -huh. but I, I think um, um, we are, we're moving out as fast as we can, although I'm sure our community is somewhat frustrated <laughs> at the speed at the moment. Right. And obviously we're talking about this on a day and in a week where Boeing 737 Maxes are being grounded around the world out of concern. I mean, what we hear about flight and flight safety in general, it's in the context of plane crashes and, and sort of, you know, massively tragic events. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> I, I, Ari was looking at me, so. <laughs> Actually, so, I did. Yeah, so, so just, just a quick comment. Um, I, I think uh, aviation, uh, as a person who has spent entire professional career in aviation, um, the public acceptance for accident is very different uh, compared to ground transportation. I think that's just given. Um, I completely understand and support why that is. Um, so we have this, the safest uh, record uh, in, in entire mode, any mode of transportation, aviation has the safest um, uh, mode of uh, transportation. So. Um, I think um, we will not compromise safety, whether it is uh, urban air mobility or anything else that's being added to enhance our lifestyle. So I think that is the, the really big uh, issue for the community to wrestle with. So, I, you know, I think the, the, the fact that you raised that in the way you did just highlights the, the point that for this on-demand mobility space, um, safety is going to be the starting point. Right. Um, it, it, it's, it's table stakes for being able to move forward with commercial operations and have a successful business in this space. All of us expect that when we get on an aircraft that we're going to get to the, the, other, the, the other end safely. And, and in large part, the system does that very well. The expectations are very high. And so when I think about the question between the U.S. and China, this is a global industry. Um, and there is a lot of interest in how do you bring this technology to market as quickly as you can. At the same point, you know, for a company like Bell, safety is first, and it, it shouldn't come to market in, unless we're absolutely convinced that we can provide at least the same level, if not a higher level of safety as the system provides today for other, other parts of, of air travel. Um, so, you know, we're working with a number of regulatory agencies. I think the biggest opportunity and the thing that we're asking the FAA to do is to continue to work with global regulators because what we don't need is, because this is a new technology, for the U.S. to head one direction with regulation, Europe to head another direction, and Asia to head another direction. And in the end, as a, a global industrial player, we're trying to now meet multiple different sets of expectations and standards that might be asking us to do things differently on the aircraft or in the operations or in the air traffic management, rather than having a consistent opportunity worldwide, which would be best for everybody involved. Right, and I, part of what I thought you were gonna go with that, you didn't, but part of where I thought you were gonna go with that is just by way of safety standard, I could imagine that, I mean, it sounds to me like what you're saying is maybe China has, a, not maybe, it sounds like China has a higher risk appetite than the US when it comes to this, and so, if there are accidents over there, it's going to have repercussions here in terms of how we see it. So, so, so I certainly didn't say that. I, okay. I don't think I don't think I don't think Taiwan intended to say that either. Um, you know, I do think that that. Um, I mean, do they or don't they? It's just like a matter of fact. I I, I, w I wouldn't say that, right? We okay. we engage with regulators around the world, and I think all of them are, are looking to make sure that their aviation system is safe and that they're providing a safe system for their citizens and people who are flying in and out of their countries. Okay. And then you were going to say, though, something. 
I'm oh, not sure where I was going to go with yeah. that one. <laughs> so, so since I said that, um, I, if I can have an opportunity to uh, clarify that, I, I was talking more about during the development phase. Mm -hmm. So um, they, I think uh, there are other countries who have a uh, um, higher tolerance in taking risk in during the development phase, not, not actual commercial operations. So I think that's a, that's a difference between um, you know, whether co other countries are willing to really take a less safe uh, system. Th that's not what I meant. So mm. hopefully uh, I, I'm and, and I do think from an industry, uh, industry perspective, that is an area that we continue to work with FAA and, and our partners at NASA to be able to move forward with how do we test how do we test in a real environment to make sure that we have what we need to go to commercial operations where people like us can use these vehicles or so they can go into a cargo carrying situation. And to do that, we can't just fly over completely remote areas with somebody always seeing the vehicle. We have to move to beyond visual line of sight where it, the aircraft is operating on its own. We have to move into places where we're flying over people. And, and certainly there's a safety framework around which we need to do that. but we do need to move quickly to be able to move into those spaces. So we need to balance that, when are we ready, and then go actually execute, rather than kind of arbitrarily holding up because you know, a, a, a safety-based regulatory agency is always gonna be inherently kind of conservative in their approach. Mm -hmm. And you would asked earlier one of the barriers, and I think we think that this, from a government point of view, is one of the barriers, is who's gonna allow those pilots in a real-world environment where you can actually test the vehicle in an urban space beyond exactly visual line of sight over people with buildings trying to use this version of a UTM system, whatever it looks like. And that could, in theory, be a competitive advantage for where you'll end up seeing the early use cases. I'm sorry, a competitive advantage? For the, the, this, the governments that allow that to happen, mm -hmm. you could see the market shift a little bit there at the beginning because that's where the vehicle operators will go, that's where the system providers will go to be able to actually test it in the real world. That makes sense. And yes, one more question I have, and if you want to start lining up for questions as well, if you have any from the audience, and we can see if there are any online as well. The final question I wanted to bring to you is I had a, a fascinating first full day at South By. I went to the Bell um, simulation. You had basically a VR setup, and I, I went in, did any of you go to this, the, the Bell simulation? Did you? Maybe a handful. So I sat in the VR setup. It was sort of like a gaming environment. So I sat in the chair, and there were three different chairs that simulate different kinds of, um, you're basically being the pilot for one of these flying taxis. Uh, and the point that was being made is actually, when they're first rolled out, it's not going to be fully autonomous. You're going to need drivers. Um, and this was fascinating to me. I mean, talk about being in 2019. As I was trying each of the chairs out and seeing if I was able to like use a pedal well or a reel or just different sorts of functions, um, they explained to me I was actually training their algorithm. Because what they're doing at these expos is collecting data on how we actually respond um, to these simulations to help them actually build the software that helps them correct the vehicle for us. But the, po the point is, and this is fascinating to me, the point is that you anticipate as an industry that you will need lots of drivers, at least at the beginning. Far more drivers than there are commercially available pilots now. And so you're trying to outfit the hardware and the software so that there's a different kind of license one achieves to fly one of these vehicles, and it's just a lot easier to do, is that right? Yeah, so the, the three seats, you have a traditional rotorcraft setup of controls, um, which for people who are good at, it's amazing, but uh, it is challenging to learn. Yeah. And then it goes to progressively more intuitive sets of controls. And what we're really trying to look at is future control opportunities for aircraft. Um, we're going to need pilots for you know the foreseeable future. I'm, I'm not sure when there's a point when we're not going to need pilots. But as we augment the pilot, um, to be able to do the functions, how can we make the control of the aircraft more easy, more intuitive, and, and really have the pilot focus on the things that humans are really good at doing, making decisions, dealing with emergency situations, and other things that algorithms can have more challenges to do. So that's what we're looking at there, and it isn't just for the air taxi situation. 
Um, at, at some point, maybe a pilot, there's a, there's a pilot and there's an aircraft operator and they're not the same set of training that's required to do those and there will be aircraft that will be able to have an operator as opposed to a full pilot. Interesting. Did you add? Oh, so yeah, that's the evolution, I think, from a single pilot, you see a remote pilot, which think of, instead of you sitting there moving that, that you're actually, it's like a video game, but you're sitting there as a remote operator and you can, it's one to many. It essentially goes from one to one to one to many, and they have the ability to intervene at different points required. Mm -hmm. But the, the intention is to have a system that essentially the vehicle has the intelligence to operate in as many environments as possible, and the system as a, as a collective is able to communicate, so there's limited need for that human intervention. Mm -hmm. Great. Are there any questions from the audience? There we go. If you line up over there uh, at the uh, mic. Thank you, because uh, yeah. then everyone will be able to hear you. Please. Uh, thank you for your discussion. I'm really interested in those kind of things, like a flight uh, for a person who's working in the automobile industry. So what is the like, most attractive scenario in the 2025? Like, like a scooter, I can almost ride in the scooter in Austin in almost everywhere. So can I take a, like, a personal flight to go somewhere? Or just I'm curious about uh, kind of a big picture from each side. So, so in 2025, again, I think it'll be um, limited operations. It'll likely be in a few cities. And, and yes, there would be a series of nodes, the takeoff and landing sites around a city. Um, it, it's not going to be picking you up on your driveway and taking you to your destination. It really will be a multi-mode trip where you walk, ride your scooter, the bike, uh, a car to get to the location, take off, go to very near where you want to be, and then finish your finish to your destination, saving you time and, and doing it for a reasonable cost. That's what I expect to be in place in 2025. Yeah, and uh, just one point to add: there are some um, developers, vehicle developers, who are aiming for recreational uh, use of these uh, vehicles. So I think uh, it could be coexisting uh, in the beginning in how. Um, all these different missions or applications will pan out. I think the uh, public will decide. That might, be, might have been my question. I was just observing that this felt like a, a bus where you, you know, kind of go to a station and, and a place where it takes off. It, someone, the bus driver, the pilot drives you, you get off, and then you get to your destination. But last year I was here and there were people talking about personal UAVs, and th there was no discussion of that, so I just wondered if that just not feasible or that would change, take a whole different kind of FAA system and training system or wh why aren't we talking about that as an alternative? That's interesting. Just a follow-up question to the question or just, uh, what's your name, sir? Steve. Steve? Steve what? <laughs> Brand. <laughs> <Bell. laughs> so Steve Boeing, you know. <laughs> sure. So, Steve I mean, Bell. part of how you're hearing this is actually now it's like we're toning it down from last year. So, so I don't think so. I think it has to do with, with actually who's on the panel. There are certainly people out there that are, are, are in the process of developing um, what would be personal air vehicles. Uh, and if you come a little bit later today, uh, Anna Dietrich will be here for the, the, uh, the 2 o'clock panel. And certainly Tara Fuji is in that space. Um, so you might be interested to hear her comments. I, I think for Bell, uh, what we see is the greatest opportunity and the biggest opportunity to impact people is to work within a system which is going to be a fleet of aircraft um, that will operate. We also think that probably is the most manageable from an airspace perspective as well. So, so we think that's the best opportunity in that kind of time frame uh, for us, but other people have a different perspective. Yeah, I, mean, I think the other factor we look at is um, cost. So you could absolutely, there are concepts and there are vehicles that you could have for personal individual ownership, but they likely be um, more expensive and so only accessible to a certain uh, income bracket. And then there's the added challenge, of course, of how that, in and also much more random in terms of the trips they take versus some of these use cases in a fleet or a transit-like solution where they're a little bit more predictable and then the traffic management system can manage it. But I, I don't think it precludes those um, higher income bracket folks having access to the individual vehicle as well. Thank you. Um, I have a couple um, quick questions. Um, I hear you talking a lot about electric-based um, systems, and I'm curious about hydrogen fuel-based um, technology. 
applied to these um, vehicles. Also, um, I'm taking away that you're primarily talking about small person capacity vehicles, and I'm wondering if you're also uh, developing um, systems that can carry larger capacity, and that may also mean that's less vehicles to manage in the system. And finally, will we have to deal with the TSA? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I can hit a couple of those, and maybe maybe Jaiwan can jump in on the hydrogen part, and um, maybe with the TSA. But um, so so with regard to the 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 energy source. You know, we at Bell are looking at a lot of different energy sources. The initial two vehicle families that we have out, one is fully electric with it is battery powered, one is a hybrid electric with the turbine and batteries. We continue to look at fuel cells and other potential energy sources. Once you design the power system to be fully electric, it really doesn't care where you get the energy from. So that then becomes a system integration, a safety integration um, opportunity for you to make those design choices that we talked about earlier. Um, in, in terms of the, the passenger capacity, um, certainly we are, we are looking at Nexus actually as a family of vehicles that could go larger or smaller. Um, Jaiwan talked about one of the primary challenges being weight, and particularly with going to electric, um, and the potential size of vehicles that you would need to carry larger passenger loads than the four plus one that we've shown with Nexus, um, that creates another, an, another design challenge. We're continuing to work that, but there's additional technology, I think, development to happen to be able to get to that point. And then for the TSA, certainly we're gonna need to be able to clearly identify who the passengers are, understand um, information about them, be able to get them to the right place at the right time. So there will be some check-in procedure that has to happen. Um, how that works with TSA, not TSA, that's part of the kind of infrastructure integration that has to be, uh, has to be determined to be able to make this work. I, I will tell you that working with Uber and others, the idea is to make that as seamless and streamlined as possible um, so that it would, you know, it, it would not be uh, a burden, something with you know long lines and, and, and other concerns, but uh, certainly the safety of the system depends on us recognizing who the passengers are and making sure that we're getting the right people in the right place. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Michael uh, provided pretty comprehensive answer there. Only one point to add is um, it, it'll really be um, economics uh, that will drive uh, which. Uh, which will a lot will be the best uh, fuel source in the future. So, um, as, as you know, in the automotive industry, they are really working uh, not only batteries, but also fuel cell, uh, hydrogen-based uh, uh, power generation system as well. So, um, it's not just only uh, aviation side, but all these other uh, industrial sectors working on hydrogen economy uh, we will see how that goes. So I think as it, Michael is exactly right in my view that it, it's all depend, it all depends on uh, applications and markets and system integration issues. Um, a quick question in relation to the second or third order societal impact. So I think of, I don't know if anybody was here a couple of years ago when um, Jimmy Wales from the Wikipedia Foundation was here and he was talking about the things he was interested in. So for example, self-driving cars how that could have an impact on a teacher's job, right? Longer days, more responsibility for getting kids into classrooms. Um, can you speak a little bit about what's, I mean, I think of a very dystopian, all of us with money flying around, you know, looking down at the poor homeless who have no options in that regard. Like how can cities prepare so that there's not this awful dystopian future for all of us with, with flying vehicles? I mean, there's the happy byproduct of more green spaces, right? We're not pa paving over the world, but there have to be other things that communities, cities, societies can do to, to prepare on a, on a different level. Forgive me, and I know it's a no, very technical no, panel, so, so but... No, so there, there are a few things with that. First, I, I do think the engagement with cities, that, that cities are definitely concerned about that. And, and part of making this work is, is trying to get the, the cost to a point where most people can have access to this and have it be a part of their... Uh, a part of their lives. Um, the cities are really, I think, looking at it exactly along the lines that you mentioned, which is how do we make life better for all of our citizens? And, and this can be a piece of that because if you get part of your, your mobility in the air, then you've relieved some of the mo mobility challenges on the ground. The ground doesn't go away. The, 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 the kind of title death the roadways, I think, is a little misleading because we're not intending to kill the roadways. We're intending to augment them. Um, 
there was a, a quote from uh, one of the city leaders in LA that really talked about the idea of this mobility is not about relieving congestion, it's about allowing the city to grow and benefit from the transportation system. And I think if we all take that view, then we can make life better for everybody. Um, you know, I think I have, uh, you know, some personal experience with folks who have disabilities and when I think about autonomous cars and, and this urban air mobility opportunity, for somebody who uh, is blind or otherwise has disabilities that, that limit their mobility today, this kind of a system will give them a freedom that they don't have today. So we also need to look at the positive side of the story, that there are a lot of people whose lives will be different and better because of what we can do today that we couldn't do 10 years ago. Yeah, I might add one of the things we've looked at from a city point of view is does having access to a transit solution that allows you to live 60, 70 miles outside of a, of a working center um, but still have a 15, 20 minute commute, does that suddenly change the way in which we build our cities? Does that change the kind of congestion and, and urban density that we live in today and allow you to live a, a better quality of life, more access to to air and nature, but still have access to the same kind of economic opportunity, does this enable a totally different way of living and relieve some of that pressure inside the infrastructure of a city which, is, which has a lot of pressure on it today? I would add that as one of the positive dimensions of, of this as well. Hello, I'm Arielle Gold from the US Department of Transportation. I just want to say I loved that question. Um, uh, yesterday we had a bunch of panels uh, looking at the future of transportation, accessibility, future of freight, urban, rural mobility, and, and other topics. Um, and, and we were trying to understand more of what the federal, non-federal role should be in all that. I've heard you mention a handful of federal agencies, of course, NASA, FAA, uh, TSA. I would love some of your thoughts on other federal agencies, whether it's other parts of the Department of Transportation or Health and Human Services, other just maybe outside of, of what you guys have been talking about that might have a role in making this future happen? Yes, yeah, so um, I think the um, administration is very much interested in bringing all the necessary uh, government, federal government entities to uh, work together. So that's also in works. Um, and I think. Um, um, as we've been talking about how important the uh, local government uh, role is, because this, this is not going to be a uniform uh, application or um, the na nationwide uh, uh, consistent uh, message, uh, method. I, I envision that it will be more like evolve, evolving more like a, a cell phone uh, service providers. So, one company can be specialized in some, some strength and some uh, features that works very well in really heavily congested areas or um, another company would try to uh, market some different features. So I think the variety of these possibilities, as Michael uh, talked about all the other uh, societal benefits that's, that, is part, that could be possible, I think we really need to think about how federal government coordination and um, working together will uh, help also local governments uh, in the country to work together. So that's why like an uh, uh, organization like McKinsey, I know that they have been working very heavily, I, I don't want to speak for you, but <laughs> very heavily with the local governments uh, to figure out uh, where this public-private partnership really needs to uh, flourish. We, because we're nearly out of time, we can't take additional questions. Maybe after you can come up and speak with the speakers. But I would just ask each of you to just give a closing thought as we wrap up in you know two minutes. Please. Mm -hmm. So I, you know I think the the closing thought here is that there's an exciting future ahead of us. The technology is not really the limiting factor. It's integrating the technologies into a system that requires policy regulation. It requires cooperation between industry and government. It requires cooperation between federal and local. And, and so the more that we can have this kind of conversation, make sure that we're addressing the concerns about how does this equitably deal with all of society and not a small portion of it, and make sure that we understand how we move forward with this together in a, in a way that's a positive benefit for all of society. I think the, the more we can do that and the sooner we do it, the better, because it's coming, and it's coming sooner than a lot of people think, so we need to make sure that we do it the right way. Yes, um, I, I really enjoyed our conversation and appreciate your time. I think the uh, important thing that we would like to uh, remember, um, all of us, is 
how the uh, smartphone or any other 21st century technologies have come to our lives. Um, people wouldn't mind uh, spend thousand dollars to buy these uh, smartphones. Uh, we probably don't need that <laughs> to, to pay for thousand dollars, but uh, it, it happened. So um, I think a lot of people uh, don't think about the benefits that we're getting and the, the capabilities, new capabilities we're getting. So as Michael said, this I think is definitely coming. And it's, it's not going to be just another addition to transportation mode, but just like cell phone or smartphone changed our lifestyle and our societal behavior just, just all together completely, I, I envision that this uh, new capability being added and uh, augmenting uh, the city transportation will actually change our lifestyle completely. Uh, so that's very exciting, and um, NASA is very uh, uh, fortunate to be able to uh, provide some enabling technologies to open up this market. Yeah, I mean, I would echo that. I think when we look at it in the last two decades, transportation has basically been the same. There's been very limited innovation and disruptive change, and now we're in a time where I think in our lifetime we'll see more step change in the transportation ecosystem, whether it's electric, autonomous, or flight, than we've ever had the opportunity to see before. Uh, I think that's just an exciting time for us to be here and, and think about what that looks like. I think the ecosystem will transform considerably from what we've been used to. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of people are learning to play nice with each other to get us there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.